All right. Well, welcome to our Tech Talks discussion, and thank you for joining us as we just discuss design thinking. Um, if you haven't met me before, my name is Caitlin Elphinstone, and I'll be your MC this afternoon. Before we begin, I would like to thank our sponsors, Cayman Tech City, who have partnered with Digital Cayman and Kirk ISS to produce the ongoing series of discussions. If you have any questions for our speakers today, please send those through the Digital Cayman Slack channel called Tech Talks, or you can add your questions directly to the YouTube feed. I believe it's along this side. <laughs> Following the discussion, we will have time for a Q&A session, and I will reappear and read your questions to our speakers then. Ben Taylor and Ben Little, it's a pleasure to welcome you both, and thank you for bringing your wealth of knowledge, not to mention experience, to today's discussion. I'll hand the digital stage over to you, and you can take it from here. Great, thanks so much, Caitlin. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you so much for having us. Uh, we're really excited to be able to spend 60 or so minutes with all of you talking about design thinking. Uh, um, we certainly wish we were able to do this at the Wolf's Den uh, because that's an awesome name for a place, but uh, we will instead uh, use the uh, come together virtually, uh, which is actually a little better because I think we were the only two who were supposed to be virtual in the beginning. So, uh, you know, we appreciate everybody attending. Uh, however you're able to uh, join us tonight. Next slide, Ben. So in the time that we have together, there's uh, a couple of goals that we want to make sure that we get through. Um, of course, the most important of which is that we want to introduce design thinking to all of you. Um, our expectation is that um, there's probably various levels of, of proficiency and um, uh, familiarity with design thinking, but We'll sort of take it from the beginning um, and use this as an opportunity to really introduce the basics um, and also the areas that we think, you know, going into the business competition, you know, maybe most relevant to you as you start to think about products and services that that you're looking to design. Um, unfortunately, we can't turn you all into design strategists in 60 minutes. Um, this this presentation is actually excerpted from. Um, a larger two to three day seminar that, that Ben Little often leads. Um, but we're certainly happy to talk with anybody after this, uh, if you'd like to learn more or hear about some of the areas that maybe we don't get to cover. Um, and of course, to really drive home some of the points, um, you know, we'll share different stories and lessons um, from our experience, um, you know, from different companies that we work with uh, and projects that we've undertaken. Um, ideally, these will help make uh, some of the conceptual things that we're talking about more relevant and um, you know implementable for the things that you're working on. So again, really excited that you're all able to join us, um, and I think we'll have a, a you know a great conversation over the next uh, 60 minutes or so. Perfect, uh, Ben. Do you want to go ahead? traditional um, remote culture fashion. I needed to find the unmute button. So <laughs> here we are. Um, nice to meet everybody. If virtually, I look forward to seeing where this uh, business competition goes. This is a pretty exciting proposition. A little bit about who Ben and I are and whether or not we're worth listening to. Um, my background is a mix of technology and anthropology. I um, most recently headed up Venture Strategy, which is um, basically just a fancy phrase for strategy at our digital incubator for Siemens Health and Ears. I also teach at MassArt in Northeastern here in Boston, where I live. If you might have um, might have guessed from my you know, wearing wool, I am not on the island with you. So um, the, some of the companies I've gotten to work with down the side here, one of the, the great things about a fair amount of my career being in consultancy and agency roles is that I can pretty much look to these logos and say if they've done cool stuff, you can think of Ben Taylor and I, uh, but anything that you might kind of question, we probably had nothing to do with. Uh, we get to work at the frontiers of really interesting spaces where there's energy for growth um, or, and as well as resources for growth. So a lot in new product development and just figuring out the future of, of new markets. Some of kind of what my world tends to look like, as I mentioned, you know, one of my core skill sets or, or roots actually comes in anthropology. This is a photo from an expedition I was on uh, now many years ago in the Himalayas, um, back when I, I didn't have quite as many r white and gray hairs, but interviewing people, understanding kind of 
how they think, what what they think, um, and then you know bringing that into commercial settings. It looks a little different, but it does exist in commercial settings. This is a lab I helped build out in London. We had another one in San Francisco, and um, and just the 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 practice of design thinking. I'm, you know, want to show some of these photos just to say there there is a range of possibility for this sort of practice. It can go as far as this kind of formal approach and, and it can go into people's yards and kitchens. I spend a lot of just working wherever there are people, um, including in operational settings like like this is a pick and pack warehouse or call centers um, and employee kind of experience. There, there are people all throughout the system that we tend to focus on. And then for my work, this is a photo of my office from a couple of years ago, but just what it tends to look like come back and, and just make sense out of everything and make it into something workable that we can then go to our engineering teams and, and start to build with. So um, there's a little bit more range to all of that. This is some of the kind of the process that is a whole other presentation that my, my team at Siemens that doesn't exist anymore, a whole other story to um, would have followed, but it's uh, it's not the, as Ben Taylor said the, at the outset, it's not necessarily the sort of process we're going to dive into today of how to build this at scale. We're gonna we're gonna get into just a couple key parts that we think might be useful for you going forward on your journey. So um, that's a bit of my my background and perspective. Ben Taylor, tell us about you. <laughs> so Ben and I share uh, quite a bit of overlap, um, but my you know sort of formally my most of my career has been spent uh, in innovation strategy and uh, intellectual property uh, IP strategy related roles. Uh, and again, you know, similarly, uh, you know, a mix of large companies, large multinationals to small startups, you know, have had a, a chance to work across the spectrum. Um, and, you know, during that time, uh, have founded a few of our own companies, uh, both consultancies and products and services. You know, I, I will say, um, you know, whereas Ben is, um, you know, has spent a lot of time, you know, upfront really with, you know, understanding customers and eth ethnography, you know, related aspects, you know, one other area that we we sort of work on a lot too, and I focus on is sort of the end product. And, and so how do we take a lot of services and products and, uh, you know, different things that our clients create and, and turn those into, you know, protectable items in the way of patents. Um, so, you know, we, we are able to work a lot across, uh, you know, from kind of early understanding of the customer through, uh, you know, how do we actually create the products and, and protect them all the way through. So it's, um, you know, we have a, a lot of fun doing that. Um, the next couple slides, Ben felt compelled to share a couple ambiguous slides of me doing things. So uh, these these few are are uh, really from you know patent and IP related sessions. Uh, you know, most likes of my work in, notes historically right? has always been um, you know sort of client you know located at the client you know working in their facilities uh, you know really helping to pull out. Um, you know, what are, you know, core solutions and, you know, figuring out ways we can, we can protect those. So um, the next slide, uh, I was saying to Caitlin earlier, usually my family and I take an annual trip to Cayman in February, very disappointed. Uh, we won't be able to get there this February, but uh, I do hope at some point in the future, I have a chance to, you know, certainly connect and meet with, meet with some of you when we are on island. Um, so Last slide again, uh, just, uh, you know, most, uh, much of my my focus and much of what I work with clients on is really in that facilitative capacity. So, um, you know, again, excited to be able to share our thoughts on design thinking with you tonight and, uh, you know, to answer as many questions as we have or, or are able to, um, you know, in the time that we have this evening. So let's dig right in um, and kind of start at the very beginning here. Um, so design thinking, what exactly is it? Um, and if any of you have taken the time to maybe, you know, look up the definition or you've been curious about it, or perhaps, you know, maybe you've been tasked within your particular organization or firm to see or think about whether a design thinking process would be right. You've probably seen something like this model. And this is one of, you know, many different models that are out there, but I would say it's, it's, Sort of the baseline. It's the it's the Stanford D School process um, that takes us through, you know, empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. Um, and while we can't unpack this full process tonight, what we really want to focus on are you know two particular parts, um, and that's the empathize, 
you know, which is really about understanding your customer, you know, knowing their needs, knowing what's important to them um, in the prototyping piece. Um, and so that's, you know, once you understand those needs and you are thinking about potential solutions, how do we actually go ahead and, and test those and, and what are some easy ways? And, you know, again, there's a lot to unpack in this process, um, but at the end when we finish, you know, there are a few different artifacts that we want to leave you with um, that we hope will help you, you know, whether you're entering the business competition or whether it's just something that you want to bring back to your own or own organizations um, to use internally. Um, and so the real question is, you know, when we think about the design thinking process, um, you know, why is it that we want to bring, you know, empathy right to the front? You know, why is it that we want to have this process potentially as part of the ways that we're creating our products and services? Um, and the real answer is that when you are thinking in this way, um, it's really value oriented. Um, you're trying, you know, in, in everything that you do in the way that you're shaping your products and services, you're, you're pushing towards the customer. Um, and as we think about, you know, really any sort of um, chain that's linked to a product or service, there are certainly value, there's value in every step in that process. So if we were to think about something like coffee, you know, it's coming off of the plant, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of originating there. And then, you know, as it goes to, next slide, you know, it's gonna go to, uh, it, it, it's gonna form into that, you know, it, it, the bean, um, and it's gonna originate as a commodity. And then from the commodity, you know, eventually it ends up as a wholesale good. Um, you know, somebody is purchasing this and that there is value happening along this process, but at this point, you know, it really hasn't um, touched the consumer in any meaningful way other than it has just started its journey towards the consumer. But once we talk about from wholesale goods going to retail goods, there starts to be a value exchange that begins to impact the customer. So, you know, if we think about retail goods, you know, how does coffee end up in, you know, grocery stores? Um, how does it become something that, you know, we as the consumer can start to physically consume, purchase, you know, it, it starts to meet a particular need that we have, that does start to create value for us. We are willing to start, you know, paying for that. Uh, we're willing to pay for different types of quality, you know, as it relates to that retail good. So, it, you know, certainly it does matter where, you know, things originate from. But once we get past the retail good, just the need to physically, you know, consume uh, or use something, then there are a lot of really interesting uh, scenarios that can take place. So, you know, as we stretch into services for our customers, so taking that, you know, that physical or digital good and, and sort of layering something on top of it that starts to make it either, uh, you know, more meaningful or experiential, you know, we can again, you know, charge more, it's creating more value. So um, providing different types of coffee, you know, creating unique, a unique, uh, unique environment in which um, the customer can consume that beverage, you know, they're willing to pay more for that because it's something different than they can maybe otherwise get on their own. And then as we start to really push out, you know, really into the, the sort of primary customer domain, how do we tie, you know, what it is we do with an experience that goes beyond just the actual product? How do we make it meaningful? Uh, how do we make it something that they remember? How do we make it something that perhaps instills a behavior um, that they want to pursue again and again. These are where uh, not only is it creating the most value for the customer, but it's also creating the most value for you um, in terms of uh, you know, pricing and other things that you're able to do, um, you know, having created those products and services. So um, you know, as we go through the presentation today, you'll, you know, you'll hear us talk, how do we continually you know, keep that focus on the customer? How do we continually push towards, you know, really what is going to be the most meaningful um, product form or instantiation of what we're doing so that it is reaching them in the most meaningful way? So, you know, thinking of experience as that, that big word um, where we've got the maximum value created, that's, that's part of the, like, why design thinking? Why has this worked? And we've, we've, poked and prodded at, at this, it's it's one tool, right? It's one method or theory among many out in the world that, that we've used, that I'm sure you've used. Um, and 
it's part of the question of why design thinking. Well, design thinking, we do think, has a, a special quality of orienting to that kind of point of maximum value. And that's the pivot point where a lot of innovative things happen, even, even deep in the supply chain, tech stack, what, what have you. Um, so, you know, what is innovative or why is that innovation uh, flourished and, and found ground to, to successfully deploy in a market? Um, I want to just give one other example and, and introduce one of the kind of methods or frameworks that come to come out. If any of you have um, remember travel, I um, I remember travel once being a thing. Um, you know, I used to show up in a city or when I'd be showing up uh, to my home city and face the taxi, and I kind of had this dreaded, repeating dream or nightmare of of what a taxi ride is like. And this is a very, very basic journey line. It's it's how we tend to think in a lot of design thinking sort of oriented uh, work. The What are the moments along the chain of that experience that I can describe the experience from? And if anyone is familiar with the concept, uh, psychology concept of the peak end rule, we tend to evaluate our experience based on the extremes and, and what the last moment is. Um, and I won't get into that too much further than that, except to say, you know, this is not a great experience. You you first have to find the taxi. It's usually a little bit laborious. You know, maybe it's raining or snowing or or I'm tired from my flight. Um, and then, you know, I get in, I'm giving directions. I don't really want to be giving directions. Half the time, I don't know. I used to take taxis in my home city because I didn't have a car. I don't know what driving is like in the city. Um, I usually take the subway everywhere. <clears throat> Nonetheless, the best moment is, is arriving, right? And then from there, this is a very pessimistic view of the, of the journey. But um, you know, I used to live in, in Beacon Hill in Boston, not in the nice part of Beacon Hill, if anyone's familiar with Boston. Um, and, and, you know, one-way streets and narrow, narrow cobblestones and whatnot. And as you go to pay, you get told that the card reader is broken. And we'll go ahead and go out an extra couple blocks to go to an ATM um, and then sit and block that street for a second time while I wait for the, uh, the receipt to be kind of hand scrawled on the back of a magazine or, or something of the sort. When I think of, of why this was a journey that could be so wholly disrupted um, by tech companies, it's, it's really about remodeling that journey. And yes, there are some really fascinating things that came out of the labor model, the technology stack, the way it was deployed, um, the let's say just relationship with regulations and other things um, for how that diffused so quickly around the world. But to me, the thing that made it possible, the thing that made all those other things worthwhile was this this remodeling of now, um, it may still not be a fantastic experience, but it's significantly better than what I, what I had. And I, I order the car, it comes to me, it's a click of a button, it's at least easy, it's at least a neutral position. And then the whole last half of the journey I've eliminated, right? And so paying is now automated and getting the receipt is now automated. And these, these things, these potential risks uh, don't exist anymore. And so, um, so that's, that's just, a, we'll, we'll use a couple stories along the way to illustrate some of this, but we also have the, the, um, the kind of textual elements in here. So design thinking, back to the core question, what is it? Uh, if if anyone were to look similar to that search Ben Taylor showed earlier, you know, if you do an image search, you're going to see that that D school framework uh, with the five hexagons. If you're you're searching in uh, in text, you're probably going to come across Tim Brown. Tim Brown's really interesting guy. A lot of great books. Um, runs Ideo, fantastic company, and he put out this very straightforward description of it being about people, technology, and and business, and that balance between the three. When I think about that that balance. One of the questions that comes up, and part of why we're going to focus a little bit on on empathy today, is we hear a really strong signal in the business world from that that dollar sign and from the operations and technology side. We uh, we we know we know those worlds pretty well. It tends to be what we study when we go into business. Um, for for those that have formally studied business, it's what we learn, and what we tend to quickly abstract or lose is is the humanity side. And it's been interesting. I spend a lot of time with a lot of different corporations, um, and it can be it can be hard to get that view in, you know, to get that specific story of a human being into the mix. And so it's for that reason that that when we talk about design thinking and making this into a business practice, we actually really focus on on understanding that human side of it because the other two elements in the equation they, they don't need a lot of promotion. We know that we need to be operationally excellent. We know we need to use good technology 
and we know we need to be fiscally sound uh, to be successful. These are all things that will automatically make us fail well before we get to the question of whether or not we've got a product that anybody wants. Um, but we also need to have a product that anybody wants or a service. So, um, so that's the reasoning behind why we will kind of hone in on that section. But I don't want to lose or want to make sure to mention um, that it is still balanced between the three. It's not about replacing those other elements with only worrying about what people want. It's about finding some sort of alignment between them all. I'll offer so, one yeah. quick thing, but yeah, no, I just wanted to say, you know, I think part of that too is is when we look at launching something new, or if we come up with an idea, um, you know, the, the hardest of those three areas to figure out is oftentimes the customer, the one that takes the most work. You know, if you have an idea, it's it's oftentimes pretty easy to say, you know, well, I, I think this conceptually would be my technical solution, or you know, if you're looking to improve something, you know, the process is the first place to look to reduce cost. But, you know, oftentimes I think the customer is, is left out of it because it is, in fact, probably the hardest area in that, um, you know, that set of three to really understand, to really go out and, you know, feel confident that you've, um, you know, gathered the data that you need to relative to that part of it. So, um, you know, that is the challenge too. I think that's why, you know, the success of, of design thinking, I th you know, oftentimes has to do with just getting comfortable with that, which is uncomfortable. And, and I think in many cases, talking to our customers, really trying to, you know, suss out what is most important to them is, is harder than people think it will be, so. So we're gonna speed along to the empathy uh, portion of this. I um, you know I want to share just one quick story. We're we're not going to focus on the defined portion of that framework we showed earlier, but but within empathy, it is about defining problems. It's about finding something we can respond to and getting into that hard to understand territory, like Ben Taylor just just mentioned. So um, so this is a, a guy I took a design thinking course from many years ago. Framed it all as as boiling it down to we're finding problems and ultimately. It's the problem that we're really focused on. When when we were building the incubator at Siemens, we um, we actually tried to charter our investments or our, our new ventures around solving a problem because that's more how how a startup actually operates, right? If you if you don't find that your solution is fitting the problem you're solving, you shift the solution. Not always what happens in a corporate setting, right? We we will push the solution through to the market no matter what sometimes, but. Um, but when we're really successful, we're able to maneuver and and focus on solving this problem as well as we can. And so I've got a uh, just an example. I can't share too many details uh, exactly about this project, but I got to work with this really cool company in uh, in Texas called HEB, very large grocery store. They they have a huge amount of the market in Texas as well as northern Mexico. And on showing up to one of their stores, I took this photo and and realized, wow, look, we've got the uh, the kind of modern food ecosystem parked in the parking lot of this large incumbent big player in, in the space. And um, working with HEB was, was great because they really embraced design thinking. And they had this question around defining the problem of, of how might we solve your meal tonight problem. And part of this is, is uh, there's an American statistic that 70% of Americans don't know what they're having for dinner at 4 p.m., which is just astounding. And I'm totally guilty of it sometimes. But one of the things we did by interviewing people and empathizing with their circumstances, their behaviors, their situations, was really get into what are all the different versions of of this problem? How do we actually modulate this to understand, you know, for which 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 person um, your could mean a lot of different things depending on who we're solving for. And in fact, that was one of the first territories we went into of you know people who plan their meals and people who don't plan their meals. We serve them very different uh, ways through which brand. A company like HEB has uh, a lot of different brands at their disposal, a lot of different formats at their disposal. We could be all digital, we could be hybrid, we could be in store. Um, and so all, all of this through to say that was how we defined the problem. And then one of the ways we actually tested the problem, and you'll see this come back, was as simple as just writing the notification that you might see on your screen. Um, I'll, I'll use this again because it's one of my favorite ways to prototype and what we're actually testing is just, is this moment real? Is this problem really one that that needs to be solved? And, and how does this make you feel? You know, is this notification uh, something you would actually react to? What would you do now? So um, 
very quick story from HEB. We're not going to share as many big corporate stories because I know we're talking about starting brand new businesses uh, from scratch. So, so let's dive into empathy a bit, and we'll come back on a couple different stories for a couple um, concepts that Ben and I have explored or piloted ourselves. So how to talk to strangers. I know you've been told all your, your childhood and lives not to talk to strangers. So here we are now, and we're saying, go out and talk to strangers. We're going to learn a lot from them. Um, but <clears throat> the core of, of all of this roots in our ability to understand someone else's perspective. Very different from sympathy. We don't feel sorry for people. We, um, we really want to try to understand where they're coming from and how they think and how they view the world. And I often think of it along the lines of, of pulling the world into focus, right? The world is always out of focus. It's always a little abstract when we talk about something outside of our boardroom. So how do we, how do we get there? And just to throw a wrench in the works, one of the, the problems of getting there is that we can't actually entirely trust what people say either. So, uh, you know, I come from that anthropology background. If, uh, if you haven't studied anthropology, you might have heard of this one anthropologist of Margaret Mead. And I just love the saying she's got, right? The what people are going to tell us and, and then what they're actually going to do and then how they recollect what they've done or, or how they think they're going to, to act. All of it doesn't match. Now, there's stuff we can learn in that, that mismatch, that space between things where we look at how somebody wants to be or how they want to be perceived and what they actually do. And those are all things we can untangle. And we'll, we'll keep digging into that because that's something of real value that, that you can um, help, particularly on consumer products, but also in, in B2B settings as well. One of the areas we sometimes think that we're going to solve this for is um, by listening better to our customers. And I, I am not going to tell you um, to avoid listening to your customers. It's something we should definitely do. We should absolutely listen to our customers. However, um, that can be its own sort of sort of bias too, right? If we only listen to uh, the people we already have relationships with, we don't know why the people we don't have relationships with don't have relationships with us. And in fact, not only that, but if we only listen to the, the customer success and customer service calls we get, we might only be responding to complaints and that's really no way to build um, build to the future. We need to respond to those to stay, you know, stay moving and fix problems, but it's not always all the guidance we need. And so how do we get that guidance and not be just reactive? It's it's really about getting out there and, and talking to strangers, talking to someone we don't know and, and really getting into their head and their lives I, as Ben mentioned, this this whole presentation is excerpted from much longer versions of, of teaching design thinking and constituent kind of elements of the design process. And I got this post-it note up on a, on a feedback wall we had for one of them. And it just, it warmed my heart to see, you know, we put people out into, into Uber cabs around uh, or Uber, Uber cars around San Francisco and just said, go talk to the drivers, you know, understand why they're doing it and, and what their lives look like. And, and people came back and said, wow, you know, I just... I really just learned a lot um, about a totally different perspective from my own. And so I, I have to give a photo credit to my daughter here uh, and thank her for helping illustrate a number of points, but she looks so pensive. Like she's really listening to what I have to say. That's that's my drink, by the way, in front of her. Um, but really a quick point to say, you know, uh, if I boiled this down to some really just imperative things we must do, uh, we need to listen more in general and we need to talk a little less she also did that to herself, by the way. I did not put those socks in her mouth. That was, I'm totally innocent here. Um, she's a pretty funny kid. Uh, and and so, you know, when we talk to people, we're not trying to persuade them. We're not trying to sell them to work with us. We're just trying to understand where they're coming from. I'm going to take my uh, headphones out for a minute here so you can hear this. One more. She's really very handy for illustrating these points. So one of the ways we need to get to this is um, by constantly just diving in deeper. If you ask people you know, this question of why once, you might get a very kind of trite answer. Um, they might tell you what they think you want to hear. You need to keep kind of digging under the layers to get at what's really happening and why are they actually behaving or thinking this way. Um, and one just phrase we tend to use in practice is that sometimes reality is not something people want to represent. This is also my daughter in our living room getting ready for Halloween. Um, it's messy. Life is messy. Sometimes it's not the, the portrayal I want others to see. So how do you get past that and how do you get into people's lives and see the messy parts? Because that's what you're really dealing with. It's not necessarily what you're going to hear in a focus group or, 
or um, someone responding, you know, on TV or Zoom. Um, and here's here's one angle of how we can get into that. We can look beyond the words people say. We can look at the emotions they express. So I know we used to have a lot more body language. Now we've got kind of torso. Um, you know, we can see faces. There's still a lot you can learn o over Zoom about how people are feeling and, and what they're thinking. The other aspect is looking for relationships, looking for relationships to brands, looking for relationships to other people. These are structures that we we live within um, and work within. We had an example we we pulled out of the deck, but you know, I, I'll mention it really quickly. When Coca-Cola launched New Coke, they did it with unbranded tests. Um, and you know, it's not an unbranded sort of uh, launch. It's something where people do have a relationship to the brand. So again, it's all sorts of relationships, things that that come in here. Ben, I think it may be stuck. Oh no! We're still on the still on the video. You missed all of my all of my delightful. We'll click through them really quickly. Looking good. Still, at least for me. Um, oh no! Still. I apologize. Let me unshare and reshare. Technical interlude. Does anyone have intermission music? We didn't know you were getting an intermission, but here we are. I just there we go. Wrong. Yeah. I actually did it wrong. I've got to share the whole screen. There we go. All right. Let's try this again. We'll just click through my photos of Eloise pretty quickly here then, yeah? <laughs> Look for emotion. <laughs> Look for relationships. Thank you for telling me, Mr. Taylor. Of course. So, um, so what does this boil down to? You know, just a couple more points on on empathy. One is this intention behavior gap. There is inherently a difference between who we want to be as individuals and how we actually behave. Um, in in talking about this, staying focused on on my daughter and and kids, every parent wants to be a good parent, right? Anytime I've worked with a product that involves kids and families and parents, it's a universal. Everybody wants to be a good parent. That doesn't mean that I am perfect as a parent, though. Uh, my daughter would be quick to tell you, she may come downstairs and interrupt me to, to send the point home, that I don't play with her enough. I, I definitely work too much. And getting into that gap, how do you resolve that for somebody? That's a gap we can actually work with and, and try to help people get to their real goals and get to that, fill in that gap. And that gap is, um, is one that when we define the problem, when we get to what people are actually after, we can start to think of new and innovative ways to serve that real need. And so this is probably, a, I'm sure a lot of people have seen this quote a lot. It's still a favorite of mine, even for being well-tread, but how do we help people, you know, is it a drill or is it a service that makes holes in the wall? Um, or, you know, of course you can ask, why do you need a quarter inch hole, right? So let's take a step back and look at, at something that's a relatively universal product of, of the bicycle. When I think about the evolution of this really uncomfortable looking penny farthing, it looks very different as it evolves um, throughout the, the century or so into a device for speed. If I'm going, going into a race, I definitely don't want the penny farthing. I probably want something like this. But if I have something like this, I might not really be welcome on the commuter train in the morning. So my commuting bike might look very, very different. Um, and that still is not a very good bike to you know take my kids on or deliver a pizza on or, or what have you. And frankly, this guy looks in the most pain to me. Um, but you know, I definitely wouldn't take the exercise bike for a speed race, nor would I, um, well, yeah, I, this sort of speaks for itself, right? If my goal is exercise, this is a great product. It's probably not good for any of the other scenarios. But um, you know, so that sort of problem focus, I want to uh, hand over to Ben Taylor to, to dig into now one of our kind of stories to share. Sure, yes. So you know, as much as we, um, like to to share this stuff. We're also you know practitioners in the sense of uh, you know we're constantly looking at our own lives and in our environment and you know trying to find those those problems and experiences that we can maybe address. And so um, you know one one venture that we've been working on for you know a couple of years now um, is is a company called Squirrel. Um, and really the genesis of Squirrel was at the time uh, I was. Well, I was living in the home I live in now in Vermont, and Ben was in Boston. Um, and I had, you know, essentially lost a room in my house to uh, children's clothes that, you know, were not even close to the age of of my two girls. You know, we had, 
you know, a, a four-year-old and a one-year-old, but I had, uh, you know, a room full of eight-year-old clothes. Uh, and I was lamenting to him, you know, this is, this is crazy. Like, you know, I need this stuff. I want it, you know, but I just don't want it around me right now. Um, and similarly at the time, you know, Ben was in Boston with his family, um, you know, in a, in, in an apartment, uh, trying to deal with, you know, a similar amount of stuff just encroaching on his life. And so, you know, we started to think, you know, this is an area where, um, you know, our stuff oftentimes doesn't have another place to go. It's either in our environment or we have to get rid of it. You know, it's not like going to a coffee shop to be able to work or to go, you know, uh, exercise somewhere else. You know, it's either deal with the clutter or, you know, send it away and just get rid of it. Um, and of course, you know, it, that could be going to self-storage or something like that that may not be you know, the right fit for the amount of stuff that you have. So we started to think, you know, really what is, you know, are there services, is there a service um, that we could develop uh, that would help us, you know, get, move out the things that we don't want at a time and then return it when we do. And so here's, you know, for us up here, you know, and I assume, you know, pretty much everywhere, um, you know, Christmas decorations are a great, or holiday decorations are a great example are, you know, we use them, for three, four weeks out of a year, but otherwise they they tend to clutter up, um, you know, space that we might have in our house. Uh, next slide, Ben. So, you know, when we think about storing stuff in an attic, um, you know, it can look like the former slide, or especially in today's environment, you know, where uh, we're all working from home more. Um, you know, this is what an attic may look like now, or maybe what we want our attic to look like now, because we need the extra space for work or to teach our children or, you know, just for other purposes. Um, and it's not a space that we want to use for storage anymore. Um, next slide, Ben. Uh, so the idea is, and, and this isn't, this is not a new concept. There are, are different instantiations of this and, and, you know, and we've started to explore, you know, different models and things of that sort, you know, with respect to squirrel, but there is an interesting convergence, right? Between, um, you know, our need and our interest in doing something um, and other services that we're seeing in our life. And, and those things are starting to set our expectations as well. And, you know, when it comes to stuff and, you know, sort of our consumption of it, most often what is happening is stuff is arriving at our house, you know, in the form of, you know, packages delivered every day, but very rarely does it actually go out. Um, and so there, there is, you know, we started to think, you know, there, there are, there's not only a need for stuff to go out, but there are likely a variety of ownable moments that people have in their lives, you know, where it is the right time for stuff to go out or stuff to go back. And those things could be sort of milestone related, like, um, you know, holidays or, you know, specific, um, you know, birthdays or events or, you know, holidays. Um, they could be, you know, sort of seasonally related. Um, you know, summer clothes and winter clothes, you know, skis and other items, um, you know, so there are a variety of scenarios in which, you know, we would want this, where this exchange could potentially happen. Um, so, you know, we started to explore this idea, and if you go to the next slide, Ben. And so next is, um, well, this sounds good to us, but, you know, how does this work, you know, and what does it actually mean for other people? And so, we have a few different examples of these, but you know, really for us, it was about creating a quick, you know, website, getting the information up, and sort of understanding how people respond to it. This was an early website for Squirrel, just describing how the process works, um, and you know, our goal was to understand how people would respond to this sort of service. You know, does it conceptually make sense? What do they think of it? You know, if we ask them if they would participate in this sort of thing, um, you know, would they, you know, how much would they pay for the type of service? Um, the other really interesting thing that we got, and, and it was often unsolicited when we shared, you know, either, you know, this view or others, was people describing scenarios in which, you know, this would be meaningful for them. Um, and, and that's really where we started to understand, well, I, I think there's something here just beyond the idea of bringing a box to people and sending it away. It's about having these moments where somebody says, you know, that is the time at which 
that service would be particularly meaningful to me. And so, you know, again, there's there's ones that are very common, like holiday decorations or, um, you know, children's clothing. Um, and then there are some others that were, you know, that we hadn't initially thought of that, um, you know, particularly now make sense. Things like, well, now I want, you know, now I need to just get rid of clutter to make space so I can work. Um, you know, I would love something where I could uh, perhaps prepare for the next um, unforeseen event. Um, you know, help me, uh, you know, put the right things in a box so that if I need, you know, toilet paper and hand sanitizer three years from now, uh, you know, that, so we got this really rich information in terms of how people could use the service, um, you know, where they would find it meaningful. And of course, you know, that's the type of information that really helps us decide, you know, is this something that we want to pursue and, and how would we actually structure this, um, you know, in such a way that it reaches people. Uh, so I'll pass it back to you, Ben. No problem. And I'm looking at the clock. We've got about 19, 20 minutes left. So um, let's speed on to... Uh, to, to one of the frameworks we want to leave behind with you. So, you know, as we talk about, about Squirrel and about these concepts, we're, we're starting with a problem that we identified in our own lives. And then we're getting to um, a prototype that, that helps us just start to explore where people have what we think of as energy for change. What's gonna make them adopt that thing as opposed to doing what they're already doing or doing nothing, which is even probably one of the strongest senses of momentum when we're talking about innovation. And so energy for change can also be described as what are people really trying to do that they would find it easier to invest energy into something new rather than do nothing. I find it much easier to say energy for change. Um, but you know, what are they really trying to do? It's that penny farthing to the bike, um, to the you know, modern bike model, right? And so um, one way we, we get at that is by just really analyzing people's lives and, and trying to tease apart what it is they're doing and what those moments are along the way and what some of the motivations are. And in in practice, this is a 19 foot journey map I made with a client some years ago, uh, two years ago, and it was great, right? And there were eight of them and it's massive. And it, and it was a much bigger project than anything Ben and her, I've ever done for a, a startup concept. So I'm not actually necessarily proposing going and going do this. I'd say it exists out there, it can be great, um, it might be a thing you work towards as your your concept evolves, but actually I'll dial back to a more generic framework, one that you've probably uh, seen or come across, and it's the business model canvas. And the business model canvas is a fantastic framework. I've used it a number of times in my career, uh, but it's not just a business model canvas. It's getting to these two pieces within it, which, which mold into the value proposition canvas. So we want to walk through this really quickly. Um, ben, for the sake of time, I'm thinking maybe maybe we skip some of the illustrations of this. Uh, yep. But you know, starting with the jobs to be done, we walked through these in passing here, but not just the functional perspective, but the emotional and social perspective. You know, what are people really trying to do? And and if I were to encourage you to do anything around applying design thinking into your uh, your concept, your startup concept, it would be to start here and and unpack these these jobs. I just used this with uh, with a company I, I do a lot of work with these days on Monday. And uh, it was amazing the sort of things we came up with that are just a little non-obvious, a little bit adjacent to you know what we're telling people they're, they're maybe exchanging time and money with us for, because we know that some of our messaging and some of our product needs to hit these emotional and social notes as well and, and be something satisfying for people. There are very few examples where it's all functional and in fact, those tend not to be the most innovative uh, sort of areas to work within. There's some sort of value we're solving for people. There are certainly exceptions, mind you. But, and then what pains are we, uh, are we solving for people? And what gains are we creating? You know, these are, these are core elements of when I understand what people are facing and what I can do for them, of course, my value proposition is going to be a mirror image of that. And those elements, again, are, are universal. There might be some where you have more emotional or less emotional qualities, but all three of these wedges in this circle are, are gonna come to bear, even if you're selling something kind of deep in the infrastructure of technology, there's still a buyer who still has some sort of pain we're resolving for them. And so before we look at the other side of that spectrum, we kind of represent the first half on empathy and, and the, um, the other half on, on prototyping. So let's talk about, about prototyping and we can give a couple examples of just bringing things to life and, and why we do it. This is a concept Ben and I have been 
kind of batting about for the the last few really just weeks. It's kind of the hot off the presses um, version. But for anyone who follows news and fintech, you may have seen that Simple is closing. Uh, Simple, the the neo neo bank, and circulating in the kind of fintech enthusiast circles was this spreadsheet, this Google sheet that uh, went around and helped make the point that searching for banking products is really hard. You you have to go and and do it yourself to come up with a comparison that has any meaning. Most banks don't necessarily want you to do it, particularly in geographies like the one the one that we live in where um, banks are bundled it is an integrated experience and, and nobody wants to unbundle um, that experience that's already in the market because that's that's part of how the market is just structured. But seeing this sort of, um, you'd call this a consumer hack, this is people creating their own experience. We, um, we came up with, I, I must admit, and you'll see it on the next slide why, we came up with this before the news of simple closing because our first prototype has simple right at the top. But what would a marketplace for financial products look like and this might look like uh, might look like an app baked out. Uh, we we named the company Hummingbird, hence all the little hummingbird icons you see around here. And um, and what might a search experience look like? Just the act of putting it down on paper, it, it made us think through things. It made us think through the concept and evolve it in ways before we even went out and talked to more people. Um, you know, well, what what does a buy button look like? You know, what does a buy journey look like? And what happens when you click one of these buttons? People don't shop for financial products all that frequently. You know, what what do we need to do? Is it actually a nudge sort of moment? Well, maybe that gets us to thinking about uh, that. This is more about monitoring my accounts and looking for efficiency around rate and uh, rate and fee. And so then it gets over to that right hand screen of how do I actually log what accounts I have in here and start to think about where I might gain efficiency in my financial makeup of demand and um, deposit accounts. And so, um, or deposit and lending accounts, I should say. And so, you know, that got us to an even simpler prototype of, I, I mentioned earlier, the notification is one of my favorite prototyping mechanisms. I work a lot in, in digital, primarily in digital these days. And, um, you know, and looking at, well, here's something I can just put onto my, my own phone um, and hand to somebody and say, you know, what do you think of this? How would you react to this? And those are just pictures. We, we made this in Keynote. It's not, uh, it, it, we have some design skills, but we're not designers. And so downloading one of those Keynote templates and just saying, or, or PowerPoint templates and just building it in a way that you can put it in your photos um, and load it on your screen and it looks real enough. It's really about this pastiche kind of model of, of building something that's just believable enough to bring it to life. So now we have the other side of the canvas. Um, you know, what are the gain creators we need to accentuate? In the case of, of Hummingbird, it, it's about that, um, you know, that moment of savings and, and creating efficiency and um, being told now is a moment to actually pay attention because you're paying too high of a rate compared to what the, the common rates are, right? That's, that becomes a gain creator and similar to the pain reliever of, I know I'm probably not paying attention to when I should refinance my long-term debt um, well enough. I kind of trust that a broker might reach out to me. They won't always. So now I can actually alleviate that pain by knowing that somebody's got my back or I've got my own back with a good tool. And part of that helps define then what what do the products and services. Now we do also say positioning need to be uh, within this. Ben, did I miss anything? We still tracking okay? Yeah, no, no, that's great. All right. I'm taking my headphones out again. I'm going to risk it for one more video. Of dear Eloise helping us illustrate a point. So it froze again. Oh man! I'm just gonna I'm just go um, I'm gonna go without videos. I'm gonna stop trying is multimedia over international boundaries. <laughs> well. In this, you would see Eloise squirting herself in the eye several times before it finally lands in her mouth and she has such a look of happiness. This is sort of the, the realm we want uh, for prototyping. We want small, acceptable failures to help us learn our way to the, the solution we're looking for and the solution the market's looking for. And a metaphor I tend to think of this is jumping out of a plane, right? You saw the, the paper airplane before. Think of that uh, that spread from the paper airplane to getting into a real plane and getting, getting to the edge and jumping out. Before you take that leap, you probably don't figure it out in the air, right? You probably figure it out in something like this where you get a sense for how the harness feels and what, what posture you need to take at the door. 
thank you to my friend Mitch for illustrating this um, as, as we got ourselves ready to jump out of a plane. And, um, and, and that happy landing, you know, that's a matter of learning in the right context, learning in the right moments so that you have affordable lessons instead of very, very expensive failures. You, you don't want to learn as uh, far down the investment kind of cycle. You want to pull those lessons into the present as much as you can. When Ben and I were in consulting, we thought of this, uh, or we used this phrase quite often of what we're seeking is the minimum information to make the next right decision. We don't need to become subject matter experts, particularly when you're in a consulting role, but I would say, you know, when we're evaluating a couple different concepts, you've heard about even just two that are in orbit for the, the two of us. Um, you know, we're, we're not full-time on those yet, right? We're, we're evaluating different concepts. We just wanna push them along to get the next decision to decide what's worth committing to. And so I think I have time to tell one last story before we go to questions. And, um, and this is a, a story that complicates this proposal of being action biased. Um, but you know, in prototyping, we're saying, get out there, build, just start, start building, start learning as quickly as possible. But um, I'm gonna tell a story from, from Siemens of one product that we built and launched. So we were trying to build products in, in a way that were closer to startup thinking. And that's why we built an incubator. So we wanted to, um, bring in concepts, generate concepts internally, build teams, get products out there that were lean and happened fast. And we were based in Silicon Valley and um, it was great work. And I'm really proud of a lot of what we built and launched out there. But one of the first things we looked at was uh, the systemic problem of there being a massive shortage globally in healthcare workforce. And for anybody that's been watching the news, it turns out that this has not gotten significantly better. We tried, a lot of people are trying, but it's not just about there being not enough people. Part of what we honed in on, um, we didn't get all of our insights from the WHO, but they illustrated it well of, it's not just about training more people or, or getting convincing more people to get into the field. It's about managing and utilizing those people and those skills uh, more efficiently in the system. And so our prototyping language moved pretty quickly. We, we established um, multiple prototyping languages from low fidelity of these paper sketches here we did have the, the benefit of having designers on the team. I love working with designers. If you didn't know design thinking isn't a, uh, or is an ad for kind of the design discipline, I'm here to tell you it is also about, it's great to work with designers. Um, but you know, getting those prototypes, building them into here are more, more keynote based prototypes, building them into things that look like screens. If I actually zoomed in on these, a lot of them are just bars and lorem ipsum. They're, they're just enough to get the form factor and know how things thread together. And if I click on this button, that happens next. And then uh, more notifications. So we built a product um, called Humanix out of this. And it was about staffing and scheduling and ship swaps and all of these things that happen in a hospital workforce. And, um, and we actually built it. it. This is where it's not just about prototyping. It is still about getting out and building it. Uh, we, we promote kind of action sooner, but you know, still on the path to building. Here are some of the specs. And we got to a point of launch and we launched this, um, this product that was super impressive, I think. It took what was typically a 16 hour per week process, uh, 16 hours per unit in a hospital and through some really great AI that we had access to as part of the Siemens R&D kind of realm, we were able to reduce this very, very complex problem down to just over three seconds. And what happened after that is we found out that people really didn't like it. So, so why is 99.99% .99 faster not enough for folks? And Part of the, the reason behind that, and granted, this is at the end of the presentation, so you can probably guess, right? We didn't necessarily answer the right question for people. We, we made it faster, we made it efficient, but we didn't serve all of the emotional and social needs um, at, at, that were um, present in these moments, present in these structures. So what was the question we needed to answer? We went back, we went back in, and spent a lot of time with nurses in hospitals, in, in rooms like this one, trying to understand, you know, did we miss something or what, what's, um, what's the thing that's gonna make this work? Because we know the technology worked and we know the problem is real. And some of the things we started to uncover, for one thing, people don't trust computers. So uh, <laughs> saying that it's AI powered is, is great for some markets. It's not necessarily great if somebody thinks you're gonna mess with their shift and their paycheck, that gets a little personal. And so uh, particularly in this market, you see this fortune title here, healthcare IT 
doesn't have a fantastic track record of creating efficiency in, in operations. And another thing we missed, not, not necessarily that we didn't know it, but we didn't prioritize it for the first launch, um, was there are these generational gaps. And generational gaps, I have to admit, the first time I, I heard it, I joined a little after our, our first um, launch. I came in for as we were relaunching. The first time I heard generational gaps, I was like, what does that have to do with, with staffing and scheduling, right? Um, I know there are generational gaps in the workforce, big you know, Gartner reports and trends and Forrester and everybody's telling me about these things, and I, but I hadn't really brought it down to the level of, of this product and this problem. And, um, and as we talked to nurses and as we just got a little bit more of their perspective, we realized that the generational gaps partly play out because when you join the workforce, um, you know, you put in your dues, you, you work the night shifts, you work the weekends, you, you work you work really hard. Being a nurse is hard. Everybody knows that part, I think. But um, what I didn't totally appreciate was that that nurse scheduler that was spending those 16 hours, that nurse was spending a lot of time on negotiating what's fair and what really is, um, is fair for that person who put in their time for years versus that person who's fresh out of school, um, all the kind of knowing your teammates and, and an hour that matters really a lot to me because maybe my, my daughter has a, a concert I want to go to. You know that hour is going to matter a lot more to me than it might to my coworker who doesn't have anything in the same the same time block, and so that arbitration of fairness, that role for for that person in that scheduling role, it, it was a thing we were proposing eliminating effectively. And this comes out of the um, I forget if it's the first or second industrial revolution, but you know the the when you start to automate and when you start to introduce technology, you are effectively eliminating something else out of out of that equation. And we thought people would be really happy to take those 16 hours and put them right back into practice because um, the nurse scheduler is still a nurse and they, they, you know, they're out there taking care of patients, but they're also taking care of their team. And so how do we actually create a product that doesn't eliminate that? We went back and it wasn't actually a huge amount of change. For one thing, we deprioritized the role of AI, the kind of HAL in the background telling you when you're going to work. People didn't necessarily value that too much. That's good for the when we're selling it, but it's not necessarily a thing our users were like super excited about. Um, now, what does it look like then to get into uh, the human spot? A richer back end. So we realize that we can't really launch this just self-serve front end that goes into a black hole. Um, we needed to create a space for that nurse scheduler. And yes, maybe maybe we don't eliminate all um, you know, 15 hours, 59 minutes and 57 seconds of efficiency we created. But, uh, but the thing we're adding back into this model then is something that people really truly valued. So as the story of design thinking helped untangle a pretty massive investment and get us kind of on track to, uh, to a product through continuous prototyping and empathy in dialogue with one another to get to uh, something that we were really, really proud of when we were able to launch it. So what, what's the lesson out of this? One of the lessons is um, just kind of some rapid fire lightning round closing remarks here. Um, if your market is a hostile environment, don't do kind of the cut flower um, sterile environment test. It's it's not enough. If if you ask people, will you buy this? Most people are polite. They're probably going to say yes. If you put a website like the website that that Ben Taylor showed for Squirrel, and you see, are people going to sign up for this? It's very different clicking that buy button, um, putting the time and and money behind it. So. How do you get that reality infused into your prototyping and testing as quickly as possible? Websites are a great way to do that. The other is working as low fidelity as possible. So you're exploring a range of concepts and you have a limited amount of uh, poker chips to allocate. You wanna spread those out across the board. Um, you don't wanna put them all on one because that one may or may not be the thing that works. So how do you actually discover the thing that works? You, you go a little bit broad and you narrow in carefully as you get closer to, to building, to, to launching. Of course, you can't stay in ambiguity forever. It is a controlled burn, but but controlled burn. And um, and then just general kind of slideshow of you know you can find these templates online. Feel free to draw them by hand. You don't need to be an artist. Um, some of the prototypes I've made, you know, being an MBA anthropology guy, this is one I drew. It's not not great. Uh, it's okay. You know, you just need to represent it in reality. Um, and and then you need to get people in front of it. So, you know, again, all like these are very, these are things that, that an average person can draw. Um, and for some reason, I don't exactly know why, but most prototypes seem to be made at, at 2 a.m. in hotel lobbies. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It's just my experience. It seems like you spent the whole day kind of developing that understanding and then 
when it finally clicks, it seems to be when you just can't possibly grapple with what was the question again anymore. So, um, so what we're building here is that prop to go out and gain deeper, deeper understanding and continue the process of filling out this back full circle. So we're right on time. Ben Taylor, any other thoughts? No, I mean, it's, um, that's uh, a lot of great information, a lot of great information. Um, you know, I hope, uh, I know we're right at the end of our time here. So I, I hope everybody, uh, you know, was able to, you know, pull some lessons and, um, you know, ideas out of this presentation. I just wanted to take a second to thank all of you for joining. Um, certainly, you know, Caitlin and the whole Cayman Enterprise City team, we've had a chance to work with CEC for about the last, you know, seven or eight years now in, in various capacities. And we always enjoy the opportunity to come and talk with everybody. So, um, yeah, I think with that, Caitlin, maybe we'll open it back up for some questions. Excellent. Awesome. Okay, so the first question, Andrew asks, how can we co-design or I iterate when working remotely, whether due to COVID during a lockdown or due to physical isolation from global clients? So how do we do this process when we're working remotely and far away from teams? That is a great question. Um, so there are two kind of forms of co-design or participatory design um, that come to mind for me. One is co-designing with clients. And you mentioned clients. So in a setting like that, I remember at, at Siemens, one of my favorite proposals I put out was, let's go and set up a lab in the cafeteria of the hospital because everybody goes through there and we're just gonna like catch every nurse and physician and administrator along the way. And I don't think they would be okay with us doing that right now. So I appreciate the challenge with that. Um, it's certainly, I think everything takes a little longer right now. So I actually have spent a good portion of this week in a co-design process with um, a large financial institution. And you know, for us, that meant I just a, a bigger glut of prep, a lot of mural boards, a lot of um, you know, us really thinking through in much more careful detail than we typically do, what is the design sprint gonna look like to explore these concepts and, and come to some conclusions. And I know that I'm, I'm giving kind of a tool answered basis, but it's it's definitely not perfect. Um, the other is co-designing with with client with end users. Um, and I'm a really big fan of, of participatory design of getting with end users. I don't know that I have a great answer to that. It's it's certainly possible. I mean, I think one thing is we're all we're all in this experience right now. So getting somebody on Zoom, um, bandwidth can still be an issue depending on the population you're you're serving. Uh, but you know, people are a little bit more familiar with with getting on on Zoom or on Teams or on video with you to get into a topic like this. I've also been really amping up my uh, love for some um, some platforms that have already been trying to get into kind of digital for understanding people's lives, diary studies platforms um, that I'm all, I'm gonna blank on all the names right now. Um, like D Scout is one um, and uh, Vidlet is another. There, there are a few out there where you can start to connect with people um, and have them, you know, take photos around their house or around their life and, and just give you their thoughts. Again, still not perfect. They're gonna self filter, but it's amazing what people will start to share with you um, in those settings. The other is um, using platforms for feedback, whether it's community groups or, um, or formal design testing, you know, moderated and unmoderating environments like usertesting.com, another tool where it's a little bit more back and forth than it is totally co-designing. Um, it's, it's more call and response in that way, but it's, it's better than nothing. Um, and, uh, and for Ben Taylor and I, that example we gave of Hummingbird, you know, one area we're looking at bringing that is getting into, you know, I think the version I showed up online is, as anybody who's built a digital product before knows, that's probably the multi-million dollar version, right? We, we don't have multi-million dollars to build it yet. We kind of need to get a little traction first. And so who are our first users and what does that product look like? Um, you know, for, for us, that's finding a really niche community that is high energy that we can engage with. And we're, we're literally doing some of these discussions on, you know, Facebook and Reddit and such and, and getting out there with people of, well, what about this? And how about this one? Do you like this one better? And getting kind of rapid and iterative with, with those processes. So, you know, not a perfect answer, but <laughs> so there are, there are many platforms, at least to leverage. Ben, do you have any others that I missed? I mean, I have a, 
a bit the tool answer is is sort of part of mine as well and you know i have some recommended platforms that, that we've used i will say too i think this is as much of a kind of a, a tool related or a technology related answer as well as um you know kind of an op almost an operational you know answer and so in, in some respects you know one thing we've done is i found that kind of the structure of meetings have changed so the you know Whereas before we were getting together in rooms for three or four hours and it, it you know, it, it wasn't, it was sort of semi-structured. We just had a goal towards the end of, you know, doing this while we were working together. Um, what we are often using now is much, you know, shorter, but much more frequent meetings with everybody, you know, with really defined, you know, well-articulated outcomes that we expect to get to, you know, at the end of every meeting. And it's, it's not exactly that, you know, we need enough information sort of you know we but really bite-sized chunks that we feel like given the constraints that we're working under um you know hitting that is a success and you know will allow us to move on to the next thing as, as part of the the co-design process excellent um we've got a question from bianca here who says what are your thoughts on separating data from the experience you get by taking prototypes out into the field should we view data and our observations as equals when we're evaluating new projects and ideas? What are your thoughts? It's a great question and a great word to introduce here. I've actually, in some settings, um, when I get in front of a, a, a technology company, let's say, and I say, I'm here to talk about feelings. <laughs> it doesn't, it's not necessarily a language that, that people are gonna be able to engage with in those settings. And so I've actually really been leaning to talking about data. Um, as opposed to talking entirely about the human-centered process, because um, a lot of what we're working with, it's, it's termed as phenomenological data. It's data um, that is treated in a different way and it's less structured, but it is on a spectrum of, of data. Um, and so for me, that spectrum kind of perspective, if you, if you put qualitative or phenomenological data on one end of the spectrum, it's the most unstructured, you know, it's, it's the most subject to certain types of bias that we have to manage. Um, and you put on the other end of the spectrum, the very quantified the transaction data, um, traffic data, those sort of things that have maybe less meaning, but higher reliability. Um, and if I have them work together, that's the richest environment I could possibly imagine. So I'm, I'm a very big fan of using the whole spectrum of data, everything I can get my hands on. Um, in terms of, and I'm, I'm just thinking about the way the question was asked, and I wanna make sure to cover bases too. Uh, um, in terms of, Divorcing data and um, and kind of fielded prototypes, you know, I think there's also uh, a potential that you might have been thinking uh, in terms of like connecting the is that prototype kind of real? Like, is it something that people can actually interact with? Um, and and I I'm not totally sure, but just in case, um, there's there's a fake door kind of concept, or a, um, there's a story we actually didn't share uh, when IBM was testing. Um, speech to text back in the late 50s and early 60s, they would have people go into a room and speak into a microphone. The microphone would go to another room where someone would type in what they heard back onto kind of a ticker tape in the first room. And so um, in that environment, it was just enough to make it look real. Of course, like it didn't exist at the time, right? Um, and so if you can create that sort of environment to get real live, uh, live looking data out into there, that's great too. So. Um, ben and I have talked about for a couple of the concepts we shared today, you know, how do we hire a whole bunch of students uh, to like come in and just help us bring this environment to life and, and create the data we need to get up and running in a contained setting so that, um, so that we have a prototype that's working even if in a limited capacity. So two different angles on interpretation there. Yeah. Sorry, Ben. I jumped in first both times. No, no, no. That was great. I mean, I just I can think of very I can think of fewer examples where I would I would want to decouple them. Um, you know, as you pointed out, I mean that the combination of the two is where you're going to get the richest insights and allow you to make that that next right decision. Yeah. Excellent. So our next question is from Nick, who asks: um, With many companies facing budget cuts, hiring freezes, and a strain on resources due to COVID. What are some of the ways we can integrate or prioritize time for design thinking without, for example, taking an entire week out for a design sprint? Great question. Yeah, Ben, do you want to share uh, some of your perspectives on that? And I've got I've got plenty of thoughts as well. Go ahead. Okay. 
Um, yeah, this is a question I've I've gotten in multiple forms over the years, and it's not not just in leaner times, um, though leaner times certainly make it a little bit more more pressing. Um, I'm actually not always a fan of of full week design sprints already uh, to begin with. The, it's it makes it it's great for an innovation team, right? If you're if you're really if your job is to explore, um, then it's a phenomenal structure to contain and time box. However, if um, if you're just talking about in embedding design thinking in the organization, it really shouldn't be at an arm's length, ideally. I think there are ways to get out and just um, focus on learning. For, for me, learning agenda is a thing almost everyone I work with has in some form. And starting to push at that learning agenda to say, what do we not know about our users, customers, clients, whatever sort of human beings we are trying to serve in some way, employees? Um, you know, what do we not know that could shift what we do um, into a more valuable kind of direction. You know, that's that's where that learning agenda becomes a thing that is going to put empathy at the at the forefront of deploying that as a learning mechanism, um, getting out and putting tests into the world. I'm working with a tech company right now. We are looking at how do we grow. They've they've had the fortune where uh, their market, their category, is growing at an almost uncontrolled <laughs> rate right now. I mean, good problems to have, right? But that growth means there's a lot of investment. It means there's heightened competition for keywords and um, people are putting tests out into the market left and right. It's up to the game um, for us to get out and and learn and understand what's actually gonna capture people's attention. What is our raison d'etre? What's our reason to be in this market? You know, It's not just differentiation. It's kind of what's our purpose for, here for people. Um, and it's created actually some similar environments to that that leanness at the beginning of the pandemic, we we pulled back a lot of budget around more exploratory things, and and now we've got to reintroduce it. But the revenue hasn't necessarily come to match yet, and so I think that that's my the core of my answer is just putting it into the context of growth, um, and putting it into the context of of learning and staying relevant and staying kind of what's that core value proposition? Design thinking is going to be one of our our best ways to get there, particularly in a time of of unknown. Um, we, we have to sort out whole new ways of working potentially or whole new kind of markets to move into, products to launch. Um, with, with things pulling back, it becomes more of an imperative than ever to, to really make sure you're solving very, very real problems for people. Yeah, I'll just, I'll offer a couple other things. Um, you know, I think by nature of the consulting work that we've we've done over the years, a lot of the domains that we've, practiced in have been ones where companies have said, well, like maybe we could bring this in as a function, you know, and so-and-so can own this. Um, and what, what we've found is that in general, you know, when you give, whether it's IP or, you know, certain aspects of innovation or, you know, certain aspects of design to somebody and make it 5% of their job, you know, it just doesn't get done. So, um, you know, I think the questions are really good one, right? Because the ultimate goal is to get people just thinking about this as part of the overall way they, they are doing work. Um, and so in limited resource times like we're in now, you know, I, I think another really effective way to do it is to maybe you know, pick one area, to be able to just pick one project that you could work on that would fit the particular budgets that you have, you know, attribute the right resources to that, and then Really use that that project, you know, and the outcomes of it, you know, assuming assuming success, you know, as a way of um, selling the broader, you know, pitch of design thinking. Um, so while it would be great if, you know, this could immediately come into, you know, all projects and all areas that need it, you know, that's that's more than likely not the case. Um, so there very much is this. Let's create awareness. You know, let's put it into practice. Let's show success. You know, and let's continue to complete that cycle until you know two, three years from now. This is you know just part of the way that we do business. Yeah, fantastic. All right. Well, we're running out of time here, but before we wrap things up, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share? I wasn't prepared for that question. <laughs> ben Taylor, what do you got? Um. Yeah, I think you know. For me, it really does come down to, um, you know, as you're as you're exploring ideas, as you're thinking about, um, you know, what uh, what may be the business, you know, 
things that come forward in the competition or just new services or products in your your organization um you know i think there's a, an aspect here of, of you know trusting your gut initially you know if it makes sense and it, it it sort of strikes you as a pain point to pursue then you know put that on uh put that on the list but then you know really quickly be able to understand uh, you know and, and sort of focus in and try to define what that question is and in how you intend to validate it um you know and again i know when we started this you know there were a few other aspects of the process the defining and the ideating and and you know probably other pieces of the testing as well and you know again we're happy to talk you know more about those things but you know for me it's really around if you're hitting what what is most important to the customer and you're giving them ways to validate and and you know potentially prove that out to you um that's going to put you on the right path and um i guess one thing i would want to share is um you know, so I teach in a design school, like I, I teach in a couple of design programs. I'm not a designer though. And so uh, other than a huge amount of imposter syndrome, which I, I can get into, if we had the cocktail hour, I could just dig into that a lot more, but here we are. Um, it's not, it's not so much trying to turn you into designers or say that design is, is the only way to get there. It's, it's one among many things that I've learned in my career that I've just found really genuinely useful. And so um, I say that to say, you know, I'm, I'm not I'm not trying to um, evangelize that everybody's going to go out and start doing sketches on iPhone screens um, and like change up everything about how you work. I've learned things from the design field um, that are really just about alignment, about keeping the customer in focus, um, about not trusting entirely forms of data that honestly in corporate settings we trust just like gospel. Um, we, you know, trying to dislodge some of these habits that I, I know as a consumer, I, I look at some things that I've seen in boardrooms and I think, why are we doing that? Like, I, I think that's a terrible idea, but I guess it's just me, um, you know, and, and but actually I think sometimes when we, we get out and we think about using this fast action prototyping sort of approach, um, rooting things in empathy and kind of the real complexity that a human being brings to the process, you know, maybe we actually can start to just make some really good decisions and, and explore some novel territories that are sensible places for us to go. So I, I think it's, um, I think it is a valuable set of mindsets and principles and skills. Again, not the only ones. Um, I can evangelize about the good, bad and ugly side of agile too. I, I've learned a lot from interoperability and efficiency and optimization and um, in manufacturing types of settings. So there are, uh, there are a number of, of kind of things that come together and work well together. Design thinking I, I've found works just about every time I've applied it um, or used it, but but it's not, uh, yeah, it, it's gonna mean something a little different for everybody too. So, you know, try to figure out or think about what it means for you and, and your practice. And, and there are uh, a million tools out there you can pull in um, that are pretty mature and, and well vetted, that maybe even are mature and well vetted in, in your sector and in your space. Um, but there's no one way to do it. So uh, if anybody tells you they they know the one way, I wouldn't trust them too much. Um, figure out what it means what it means for you and, and kind of build those muscles, I think. Fantastic. Well, thank you both both very much for your thoughtful insights. I think you've left us with a lot to think about and a lot to um, implement throughout our businesses. Um, to everyone that's tuning in, if you or your team has a new product idea, service idea, new brand, um, or new feature to launch, be sure to check out the Cayman Islands Business Design Competition. You can find some more details on designsprintcayman.com. Um, and thank you again to our sponsors, Cayman Tech City and Digital Cayman, and to Kirk ISS for their technical support today. And with those thank yous, I will conclude today's discussion, and we hope to see you all at the next one. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.